Good morning. I nearly came up here and forgot my Bible. I got all the way onto this platform and I'm forgetting something so very important. Uh, it is good to see you all. We are in the final week of our Foundations series. And in this series, we have been walking through our denominations' affirmations. And so here's what we've talked through so far. We have covered the centrality of the Word of God, our conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, the necessity of of new birth, the fellowship of new believers, or the fellowship of believers, old and new. Uh, The whole mission of the church, and we even snuck in an extra week there with Dr. Kirsten last week on covenant identity, and this week we will be talking through the affirmation of freedom in Christ. This is probably the most, the easiest to understand affirmation, but the hardest one to apply in our day to day, and, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. In the United States, freedom is a weighty word. Uh, it has layers of meaning for us, and I would argue that in the United States, it has at least, at least from my view, two different layers. The first is that we treat freedom as a state of being. And so, by a state of being, I mean that I am currently free to do certain things. And I want my capacity to do things to ever increase. I want ever increasing levels of freedom. For example, I am free to breathe right now. There is not someone impeding my capacity to breathe. I'm free to drive a car. I'm free to think. I'm free to do a variety of different things. And then on the other side, the other layer is that we also treat freedom as a type of ideology. So it's a system of beliefs, and we'll get into a little bit more about what an ideology is because it's it's really important stuff. But we have both of these types of frameworks for what freedom is, and I think the Western church over time has embraced the American understanding of freedom as the gospel itself. And my hope for this morning is that we get a better understanding of what Jesus meant by free and what we might, that we might gain some inspiration on how we ought to be using that freedom. Our passage for this morning is John 8, 31 to 36. So please turn there with me in your Bible or your Bible app. And as you're finding it, I'm going to catch us up uh, in the story of John a little bit so that we know the background. So for several chapters, John has building suspense around Jesus' identity. It's not that John was confused. He knew who Jesus was, but the onlookers watching Jesus' ministry were asking all sorts of questions about him. Is this a prophet? Is he the son of God? Is he, is he the person that he says he is? Is this man just insane? Is he from the devil? There's all of this speculation circling Jesus' ministry. And after a couple of chapters of healing and teaching, John has Jesus clear the air. Uh, And Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. This is who I am, the light of the world. And there were many Jews that believed in Jesus' testimony. And Jesus turns to those Jews to talk to them about this thing called freedom. I hope you've found the passage by now. I'll read it for us. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. Just a quick note there. I don't think they knew their history very well. (laughs) Never been slaves of anyone. Uh, Genesis and Exodus has a lot to say about their uh, exodus from slavery. Um, How can you say that we shall be set free? 
Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, I I point that little aside out because I think we kind of have a little bit of that in us too as Americans. Set free. Well, we're free. I mean, set us free. We live in a country that's free. And we have to wrestle with this, I think, the same way uh, that these Jewish leaders have to wrestle with this. Earlier this week, I proudly told someone on our staff that I have finally breaken, broken my mold. I am preaching a sermon with no points. No points. I don't have three points this morning. It's like the first time I think I've ever not preached a pointless sermon. And that's what the staff member said. She looked at me and she said, "Uh, are you telling me you're about to preach a pointless sermon? You should go back and try again. (laughs) You have some sort of point to what what you're saying. And I promise you this morning I have a point. It's actually not entirely pointless. I, I, I just don't have three of the points. My point is this. I don't think Jesus meant what we mean when he used the word free. I'll say that again. I don't think Jesus meant what we mean when he used the word free. And if you're a type A personality that must know exactly where we're headed so that you can engage, there are some things that are going to guide our conversation. Yes, there's three of them. I really don't know what's wrong with me. I'm stuck. I can't. I can't break out. Um, They're not points, though. It's a progression. We're going to talk through American freedom, slavery to sin, freedom in Christ. That's the roadmap. Let's buckle in and get started. We have already said that in the United States, freedom is a weighty word and that it has these two different layers of meaning, that it's a state of being, my ability to do something, which I believe is mine, it's my God-given inalienable right to be free, right? That's what our Declaration of the Independence says. And then on the flip side, we have it as an ideology. And I've been digging into the word ideology and found that I didn't exactly know what it meant. For the longest time, I thought an ideology was basically an idea, an idea or a notion or the study of ideas, you know, ideology. Um, But I come to find that it's so much more than just an ideology or than just the study of ideas. Um, And this is also, if you bookmark the word ideology, and as we think about freedom as an ideology in this country, it's also where Jesus' phrase in 34, verse 34 has some traction. It's where slavery to sin jumps into the mix of this. And as someone that likes to figure out what things mean, I dug into ideology deeper and found this quote from a scholar named Bob Gudsvard. Say that name several times over again. Uh, And here's what he had to say. In its original sense, ideology means an entire system of values, conceptions, convictions, and norms, which are used as a set of tools for reaching a single, concrete, all-encompassing societal end. In other words, an ideology is not an idea or a notion. It's much more than that. It's an entire system that we design around achieving a particular idea or notion. And as this system gets increasingly complicated, That value or that norm or whatever that thing is also increases in significance in our life. So as the system gets more complicated, so does the preciousness of the idea or the notion. It becomes so important, in fact, that we start to believe it will save us. In this way, An ideology is both a religion and a liturgy that informs our worship. To that point, Gudsvard continued on to say this, ideology is religion's substitute. It says, as God, I create my own norms and values. 
I saw what will benefit humanity, and I allow no God above or power below to make any other law. An idea couldn't possibly be this dangerous, could it? Could an idea really be that powerful? Yes. Yes, in fact. An idea can carry this much power. As soon as we say these words, if I only had, and you fill in this blank with whatever you want, then everything would be better. Whatever you fill in that blank with, we have entered dangerous territory, dangerous waters. Because what we've actually done there is we've developed an idol where we're putting our hopes and salvific or salvation expectations into whatever we fill that blank in with. Then we do this with all sorts of things besides just freedom. Forewarning, I'm about to meddle. Take romantic love, for instance. We have turned romantic love into an ideology. When I was a college pastor, I can't tell you how many times I heard this phrase. I can't wait until I find the one. Now I hear amongst our student team uh, or our younger ones, my person. Most of these kind of make me a little skin crawly. Um, romantic comedies and the Hallmark movie channel has only reinforced this, right? They subtly communicate to us as we watch them or participate in them, they tell us that without a significant other, we are somehow less than, that we're somehow incomplete unless we have someone with us. We're somehow broken. But here's the reality. In the honeymoon phase of marriage, you're obsessed with one another. You're convinced that your husband is literally the best person on the planet. Then one morning you wake up, both literally and figuratively, and his face is on your pillow, two inches from yours, breathing in your mouth, and you realize that the breath is horrendous, and it tastes really bad. And you start looking and going, I don't think my husband's perfect. And then later, as this journey progresses, you realize my husband is so not perfect. The honeymoon is over. We recognize that this person we're married to is not going to complete us. They're special. They're a blessing. They're God-given, but they are not here to save us. They can't do that. I don't mean to burst our bubble, but if we've bought into the whole Hallmark thing, we've bought into an ideology. We have bought into a framework of an idea that says that I am somehow broken and less than and incomplete and I need this other person to fix me. And only when they are there will I be fixed. Well, I'm here to tell you that your boyfriend, your fiance, your husband, or your wife is not Jesus. Don't you dare amen that. You're going to get in so much trouble. That is not safe space. They are a gift by God, but they are not Jesus. They are not here to save you. We can turn pretty much anything into an idolatrous ideology. Money, work, retirement, sex, possessions, Whatever we fill in the blank with that we feel like will make us happy, that is what we have shifted as an ideology. We're creating frameworks around whatever that ideal or principle is, and we let it govern our life. However, in the case of freedom as an ideology, there's an extra thing, there's an extra danger. It's not just idol worship in the case of freedom. It's the idol worship of myself. It's the elevation of myself to a God status. It's not just worshiping a thing in the case of freedom. It's the worshiping of me. 
Because I want to be the person. It's the temptation all the way back to the Garden of Eden to be like God, knowing good from evil, to define for myself what is good and to pursue what I think is good with everything that I have, whatever that thing is. That's what is the complete self-autonomy principle that we embrace in the United States. Make your own judgment calls. Make your own values. Pursue them with everything you have. The danger here, though, is it's the same temptation presented to Adam and Eve in the garden. Be like God. In the United States, we have created systems and frameworks around allowing me to achieve the very temptation of being my own God. To be entirely free to pursue personal happiness means to be like God, knowing both good and evil. Freedom for Jesus does not have to do with us being able to discern for ourselves what is good and what is evil, and then to act in ways that we think are good. I believe Jesus would actually call that a form of slavery to sin. And here's how this slavery works for us. I'm going to spell it out a little bit more clearly. We create an intricate system of living our life which involves giving ourselves as much freedom as possible. Financial freedom, educational freedom, sexual freedom, religious freedom, philosophical freedom. And one day, we wake up realizing that we're trapped. We're trapped chasing increasing levels of personal freedom. We're ladder climbing with our careers. We're positioning our kids for athletic and academic scholarships by the age of two. We're protecting our own relevance and influence by buying the right house, the right car, the right clothes, the right things, all so I can be viewed the right way, so I can have power and influence in society, and then one day we wake up and we're suffocating from all of these things that we're pursuing because we think that if we can only grab it or have more of it, then I will be happy. My salvation hopes have shifted from Christ to that thing, and I now expect it to deliver to me something it never could, a future, an identity, a purpose. It can't do those things. And then we feel trapped because our whole life has been built around acquiring that thing, whatever it is. And we feel like we can't get out. There's no off-ramp because everything we do supports the system that we've designed. Everything we do in that scenario is about serving our own will, our own desire, what we have bought from our society of what is good. The ideology of American freedom ultimately enslaves us to our own sinful will, a will that desires to be like God, a will that wants me and mine. The freedom Jesus offers is not like the freedom America offers. Jesus' freedom is a paradox. His freedom does not result in us getting to follow the random whims and desires of our heart which change moment by moment as we're distracted by whatever thing is moving, maybe on the TV screen or the Facebook ad or, or, or whatnot, or quite the opposite, in fact. Our freedom comes from surrendering our will and laying it down at the foot of the cross and taking in exchange the will of Christ. The Christ, as John put it in the very beginning of the book of John in his gospel, the one through whom we were created, the word of God, the very word that spoke me into existence. I have the opportunity to, to lay down at the foot of the cross my will, my desire, my identity, my view of good and evil, my desire to right and wrong, and to take up the one who has created me, that identity, and through that active 
act of submission and surrender, I paradoxically am free to live out the very life that I was created for. Rather than chasing what society tells me I ought to be about. It's a paradox. At the one hand, America is tempting you to have complete, total freedom for yourself. Christ says, if you submit to me and follow my will and my way, I will allow you to chase the very things I've created you for. That's freedom. That's complete and total freedom. Now, the deal here is that that freedom comes through following Christ. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. When we surrender our will, our personal freedom, and follow Christ, here's what we get. We get freedom from guilt. We get freedom from shame. We get freedom from purposelessness. We get freedom from sin and our own will and the enslavement thereof. We also get freedom to love God, freedom to love our neighbor, and freedom to love ourselves. That's the freedom available in Christ. The freedom we have in Christ is a freedom to follow, worship, and honor God. It's the freedom to love the Lord our God with all of our strength, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our being, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, walking out that freedom in community with other believers is where this all starts to get a little bit more difficult. When talking about Scripture in the Evangelical Covenant Church, we say that Scripture is the only rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. And what we mean by that is that we hold Scripture as our guide for what we believe and how we act. It's our understanding or our interpretation of 2 Timothy 3.16 where Paul says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for training and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That said... Scripture's not always that easy to understand. If you don't believe me, go back to Romans week one in the beginning of the summer and walk all the way again through the book of Romans. Scripture gets complicated. It's hard to understand. And even when we sit in community with one another with the word of God open, we can read a passage and walk away with two very different understandings of how I'm supposed to live my life based on that scripture. One example of that has been uh, the doctrine of baptism. We have two different views of baptism that have prevailed in the church for over a millennia. One where a, an infant should be baptized. One where an infant should not be baptized, but only a believer should be baptized. Both sides of this argument have a ton of scripture around them coming to the table, reading this thing that Jesus commands for us to be baptized, and yet trying to recognize how do we work this out. Um, In the ECC, we've said that this is not something that we're going to divide about, but there are times where we read the same passage and we'll come out and we'll disagree on that meaning, on what it means, how we practically work it out. This sort of thing happens fairly regularly, actually, as we read Scripture in community. So how are we to operate with one another as a body of believers if we read the Scriptures and come away with different meanings for how to live and love our neighbor and love and honor God? According to our denomination's affirmations paper, um, this is what it has to say, and when you look at that, it really is the covenant affirmations paper. We had no other clever titles to put to it besides... That, that's what we get. Covenanters have offered to one another theological and personal freedom where the biblical and historical record seems to allow for a variety of interpretations of the will and purposes of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means two different things. 
practically. The first is that we have committed ourselves to majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors. Well, what's a major? A major is putting our salvation hopes in Christ. That's a major. He is the one, the author, perfecter of life. He is the only thing that I can put my eternal hopes in. A minor, and I'm sure I'm going to hear about this later. We don't even agree what minors, majors, and minors are. A minor is baptism, where the church for centuries has argued over which form of baptism to put out there. If my relationship with my brother or sister should not be broken down, and over baptism it should not be, then that's a minor. Then we come to have conversations with one another. But one of the things that we have to be so careful in this environment not to do is that person in disagreement with me is not on the other team. They're not the enemy. Sometimes we demonize them or villainize them that, you know, they're not one of us. That person's still a beloved child, a beloved son, a beloved daughter of the Most High King. They're part of the body of Christ. They are one with us. And so that leads us to our next response in this freedom of Christ. Lead with grace. Lead grace forward. If you know the person and you know where their heart's coming from and they're chasing the scriptures, lead with grace. Sit down and have coffee with them. Talk it out. So here's what will happen when we actually dialogue with one another, when we talk about the things that are on our heart. This mysterious thing happens. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in residence in you. I have the power of the Holy Spirit in residence of me. And then when we sit down together to talk about this thing, and if we're open about it, he's going to change both of our perspectives. Because odds are neither one of us are entirely right. The Holy Spirit will be right. He's going to guide that conversation, so we lead with grace. They're not on the other team. Friends, in Christ, we have the opportunity to live in a freedom so much bigger and grander than what we ever thought could be possible. We have the opportunity to surrender our wills and our desires, the things that we label as good, these ideologies that we have chased. We can lay them down at the foot of the cross, take up a freedom offered in Christ, to be able to live and walk in ways that he's created and designed us for. As we transition our salvation hopes from whatever we've accidentally filled the blank in that's not Jesus and put Jesus back into the blank, we have this amazing opportunity to lean into a freedom we have never known, the freedom to be who our creator has made us to be a freedom from the chains of sin and death, a freedom to worship and honor and love God with our whole being, a freedom to honor and love our neighbor as ourself. Let's lean into that freedom just a little bit more this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, We are so thankful that we live in a country where there is so much freedom. Lord, where we can gather in this house of worship, your house, proclaim your name, sing your praise, learn about your heart, and we are not concerned or worried in the least that something bad is about to happen to us because we're breaking the law. But that's not the situation of so many believers around the world. So Lord, help us to be so thankful for what you've given us. But Lord, we repent of those moments where this country also offers us this distraction to be our own God, to make our own decisions. Lord, we repent for the times that we've filled in the blank of what will make us happy with something that's other than you. And then have created systems and strategies around obtaining as much of it as possible. 
Lord, help us to lay down that attitude, submit it at the foot of your cross, and pick up your will and your life so that we might be truly free. In Jesus' name, amen.